Welcome to EAP IP meeting uh, 54. I have shared agenda in the chat for people to refer to. The first item that we have for today is core EIPs in an executable spec world. So uh, this was proposed a few weeks ago by Tim Baker. Uh, there is a proposal and the link is uh, added to the agenda. Uh, we can check it out. And this has been under discussion from past few weeks. In the last meeting, uh, Greg shared some concern for people having to learn Python to be able to contribute to the execution specs. But we were short on time to continue this discussion. Hence, I have added it for today's uh, discussion. So yeah, if there are any thoughts. Sure, so Greg and I had a um, discussion after I think it was the last EIP IP meeting about um, you know how Python fits into the EIP process and how it's not really a great fit for um, all types of EIPs. So um, well, what, one thing we were considering, and I don't want to speak too much for Greg, but um, is possibly allowing a diff against the yellow paper or the Python spec in the EIPs. Um, that might be one path forwards. Um, I don't know how anybody else feels about that, but that's basically the only update that's happened since uh, the last time we spoke about this. Right. I see there are a few questions that uh, those are being discussed. One is about the EIP number. I think there are some certain suggestions for that and then some improvements that could be made with the help of BOT. So if uh, you can maybe summarize what is the proposal on, on a like higher level and uh, the way we are trying to move forward. Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, at, at a high level, I guess the idea would be to um, change the EIP process so that instead of it being an English test text description, you'd, we, we would first start by splitting the EIP process into two parts, core EIPs and non-core EIPs. Uh, core EIPs would live in the execution specs for Well, so this, this is my proposal. It's slightly different than Tim's. Um, but mostly the same. But uh, in my proposal, you would split the core EIPs and put them into the execution specs repository. Um, and then the EIP numbering proposal I had there was basically that if you have an EIP that spans multiple, uh, each EIP number would encode whether it's a core EIP or an ERC or uh, a consensus layer EIP. Like um, so, so you'd have some extra information in the EIP number, and then you could use that information to find out where you need to look for the EIP, and then the EIPs would live either the consensus layer specs repository, the execution layer specs repository, or in some ERC specs repository. Um, and the reason why we want to, well, I'm proposing we split it up like that is to um, keep the standards close to the code that defines them. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but that's kind of the summary of the EIP numbering change. Do we have to retain numbering between when we make the switch? Can we start over from one? I'd like to execution keep it. One, execution spec two. What do we gain by keeping it? I just worry there's a lot of complexity in keeping it long-term. Um, and if we could just have a different numbering system. That seems easier. I, I don't feel super strongly about it. I think I'd like to keep the EIP numbers like and just have like a legacy set and then a future set, but like I don't really care that much. I think my, my biggest concern is about how we're actually going, like are we going to put execution specs into the EIP process or not? And I think that's a much bigger question than how we're going to number the EIPs. Yeah, I think we first need to list up the questions that we want to be um, answered first in order to progress in that direction, because it seems to me like there are too many things that we want to address at the same time, and we are not clear on which path we want to go. All right, I mean, I guess the, the, the biggest question is, do we make um, a diff to the Python spec a mandatory part of core EIPs? And then everything else is kind of secondary to that. Manka, do you have any thoughts on that? Making diff to the Python spec? To execution? Uh, I have no problem. 
I have no problem with Python specs. I would like my personal desire would be that um, execution specs repo handles everything, and that that is both the actual technical spec and the human readable stuff. I liked the way Sam proposed it previously, which is just put markdown files in there. Um, so I think Sam and I are mostly aligned at this point. Okay, I have one. Would more. you agree with that, Sam? I think so. <laughs> I have one more curious question here. So uh, we are talking about having um, uh, like execution specs for core EAPs only. So uh, what do you guys think about having uh, just for core EAPs there and uh, for rest all of the EAPs, including interface and networking EAP following the same process as they are doing right now? Or are we planning to have uh, networking and interface be a part of execution specs? I don't believe there's any current plan to move um, any of those into execution specs. Uh, one can imagine the networking probably being the next reasonable thing. Uh, the interface stuff in terms of JSON RPC has kind of already moved out of the EIP's repo, so that's already on its way out to another system. I have seen a couple of uh, uh, interface proposal, I, I suppose, for the uh, exec, um, consensus layer specs. Uh, this is I've, <laughs> I've I've argued on those issues. Uh, I so it is part of the reason we need to settle on something is because the uh, consensus layer does need a place to do their you know, have their change control process in some way, and some people want to merge that with the AP process. Some people want to keep it separate, and then things get even more complicated complicated when you have some change set that includes both execution and consensus layer changes. Um, where do you keep that document? And so that one, people are kind of pushing into the EIP's repo at the moment. Um, not a huge fan of that. I would like to keep it out, but there's, I, I acknowledge there's not really another place to put it at the moment. So if I understand correct at the moment for uh, execution uh, layer uh, specs, interface proposals are already moved out of the present EIP repository. However, for consensus uh, layer, JSON RPC stuff is moved out. Only, yes. only JSON RPC, okay. Yeah, so other, the interface in theory includes other things, um, though not much. The JSON RPC is the, the bulk of it. Um, but hypothetically, there are other things that fall into that category. Right. So giving the benefit of doubt, there is still room for interface and networking EIP with ERC, uh, EIP process. Right. Uh, I guess, I mean, I don't, so, so yes, I mean, the, I, I'm not sure the EIP process is ideal for either of those, just like the execution, executable spec, I think, is a better solution to the problem of coming to consensus around a specification. I think the same is true for the networking stuff. I think the networking stuff would be better off if there was, you know, a canonical document that ideally was computer readable. Um, similar to the execution spec, it would be like the networking spec. And that is, had some sort of change control process built into it, um, again, just like the execution, executable spec is being built. Um, however, we do not have that today, and we are not there today. And so since the EIP process is basically the only change control process we have at the moment, everything is built into it. And that includes networking, which I don't think is a good fit, and historically interface, which I also don't think was a great fit. Um, so yeah, like it's, so those things like we have nothing better. Um, it's not it's not a great solution, but it's a solution that exists. Well, it it looks like uh, that earlier we were in a position where we were thinking of moving EIP and ERC separately. Now we are trying to pull out just the core EIPs from the existing uh, change control process. Yes, at the moment, we're only working towards pulling out um, core EIPs uh, because with through the execution specs. And again, we, we have already sort of pulled out the JSON RPC stuff, which is the majority of interface. And hopefully one day in the distant future, when we have infinite engineering resources, we will also pull out the networking stuff. All right. 
but uh, this is good at least we are very clear on this part that we are not going to change the entire change control process the proposal is just for limited to core eips only at the moment whenever we get chance to update the networking and other interface eips will look into that so this is clear this is really good and now um, uh, we we discussed about two proposals. I think not two distinct proposal, some somewhere overlapping. So yeah, in that I mean, like uh, on those two proposals, the point of disagreement was including diff to Python spec. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not an uh, editor, not a, not a developer, but uh, from where I'm looking at it, it looks like because we have this uh, yellow paper written only in Python spec right now that is available with us, it seems like a fair compromise. But yeah, if you guys have any other thoughts on that. So, so Greg did bring up the point that we do also have the yellow paper, so we could theoretically you know, use diffs against the yellow paper as uh, also an acceptable way of specifying things. But yeah. For, for the listeners, the primary argument against that is the number of people who can functionally read the yellow paper is like 10. The number of people who can functionally read Python is, you know, millions, maybe not millions, hundreds of thousands. Um, just in terms of notation and general understanding within the developer community, Python is just significantly higher than the math notation that the yellow paper uses. Like it's basically, it's more accessible. Like the Python is far more accessible than mathematics. And uh, Greg's not here, is he? Like, no, okay. So his, his argument against that would be that the yellow paper is currently poorly written. And if we devo devoted as much time to maintaining the yellow paper as we are to the Python specs, we would have a much more accessible yellow paper. Um, I would be curious if that is true. I am not convinced. Like, if I imagine myself rewriting the yellow paper to be more accessible, I would I find myself ending the Python or something along those lines. Like. I don't, I don't see a path that doesn't take you to just use Python or just use TypeScript or whatever. Um, I, I mean, so if I were to do it, you know, with infinite engineering resources, I think um, doing it in a formal spec language would be like ideal, like something like K or uh, Daphne or whatever. And that, you know, you could actually use that to formally verify code and that would be the best option. Um, but no one knows those languages and they're not accessible. Um, so yeah. Right. So, so it's like, I can be convinced, I think, that writing it in something that can be formally verified has significant value. I do not think it solves the accessibility problem at all. So the yellow paper is neither accessible nor formally verifiable. And the Python spec is accessible but not formally verifiable. And so I would say that's strictly better. And then there's a third option, which is formally verifiable but not accessible. and and I can see a strong argument that that is a path that one would want to take over non form verifiable but accessible. And in a perfect theoretical future, somewhere in rainbows and unicorns, we find something that is both accessible and formally verifiable. And I think, you know, the possibility, like, okay, you know, taking off my, I'm pretending to be Greg hat here. Um, personally, I think you know, there's no reason not to use Python in the meantime until we find something that satisfies both both accessibility and formal verification. So, yeah, I guess the one of the other things that I go ahead. Sorry, if you could, had to pick between accessible but not formally verifiable, or formally verifiable but not accessible, is it immediately obvious to you which of those is better, or is that's something that like you could see argued either way like are you on the fence i i would say i'm on the fence about it like from a theoretical point but i can't make the formally verifiable spec so obviously i'm going to work on the accessible spec there were two people that like you let's say you finished the actual spec and at the same time in parallel greg finished the uh, formally verifiable spec uh, formally verifiable spec which one I would choose. Definitely the formally verifiable one for me, yeah. You think so? Okay. But I don't think we're so ever going to get that. There, <laughs> so if anyone out there listening uh, wants to devote a massive amount of engineering time to write a formally verifiable specification for Ethereum, 
uh, it's a desirable thing, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we have the foundations of the EVM and K already somewhere, so that might be a good place to start. But there's a lot more than that. Um, yeah, but, a lot more. yeah, I don't think we're... I'm sorry, it's very confusing because your Zoom icon is Pooja's Zoom icon, and I don't know what's going on with that, and it's funny. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it doesn't switch. It just stays on <laughs> Pooja's icon. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, if somebody wants to come along and have that ready, then I will gladly support switching to it. But in the meantime, the yellow paper, I think, is the most useless. Uh, an idealized yellow paper, I'd be much more supportive of, of using the EIP process. Um, and obviously, I'm very supportive of using the Python spec in the EIP process. So it looks like we are at a point where we have uh, executable specs in Python, and we may be looking for someone who can write specs and formally, uh, very, like formally verifiable uh, specs can be written with the help of the yellow paper. Yes, but just to be, to be clear, that is a monumental task. Um, and so while I, I put it out there, if someone like has a background in this and really wants to get involved in Ethereum, um, this is maybe a place, but this is like a very big task. This is definitely not a small little thing that, hey, we need someone to help out a little bit. This is like, we need someone to dedicate two or three years of their life to build this thing. Well, I think uh, uh, this particular argument gives us some flexibility to go ahead with whatever is available as of now, because I understand yeah. this executable spec is being written for over six months. And now we are at a place where we are assuming that we will be um, finishing up with all the upgrades and we'll be reaching a point where we can migrate the process. I mean, like bring the core EIPs to this process. But if we start today for with yellow paper, it will take another six to uh, six months to one year down the line. I would say more than that to get formally verifiable. I mean, I'm definitely not an expert in that area, but I would guess years of, of engineering effort. It's unfortunate that Greg is not here and uh, I'm really um, uh, a little hesitant on like uh, coming to a, a general agreement when we know that we have someone who has a different uh, thought Maybe we can bring it up in the next meeting, but from, from today's discussion, it looks like uh, moving in the direction of Python spec. I mean, a diff to Python spec is probably a good approach at this point. Anything anyone would like to add on, or if there is, I don't know, how do I put it? Like maybe, uh, kind of uh, call to action that we can do from the community looking for people who can start working on it or maybe voting kind of collecting uh, some general opinion what is the preferable I know we have limited people on the call and we get to hear what they think about but in general if people are looking for getting more opinions we can do that the gatherers can look into that part but yeah I mean, all I can say is, you know, um, I'm going to keep working on the spec well, along with the other people who have been volunteering on it. And uh, if it becomes useful for the AP process, I think we should adopt it. But yeah. I think uh, uh, working on uh, this executable spec is, is a very good idea and we should continue doing that. Thank you for you, your team and uh, so many other contributors who are working on this and maybe uh, we can share the recording of it with some other people and if needed collect some more uh, opinion from different editors and we'll also share it with the client teams if they have any preferences and we'll try to bring it up in the next meeting let's see if Greg will be able to join in in the next meeting maybe we can have a consensus then probably will focus on which particular uh, process to be adopting because I understand we have almost two proposals here. Sounds good to everyone.
All right. Thank you. All right, uh, moving ahead, uh, the next item listed here is, should we discourage the word standard in EIP titles and descriptions? I have added the issue. So uh, this is collected from the EIP GitHub repository where we are asking people to add issues which can be discussed in EIP IP meeting brought uh, in front of EIP editors. So Sam has created this issue and I already see uh, comments from Malka and Sam going on. <laughs> Not sure if there are different opinions, but yeah, Sam, if you would like to talk a bit more about it. Uh, sure. As an EIP editor, I find it incredibly annoying that the word standard shows up in the title of every single standard that's proposed. So I'd like to just add a note that we discourage the word standard in EIP titles and descriptions. Yeah, I support that. Yeah, I mean... If you, if you create a PR, I'll, I'll approve it. And then, I guess, if you create a PR, I'll thumbs up it because our approval stuff is kind of broken for AP1. That's right. Uh, yeah, so this is basically a proposal to amendment to EAP1. And um, yeah, this sounds like a fair ask. Yeah, thank you, Micah, for suggesting solution here. Okay, uh, let's see if, if any other EAP editors may have different opinion, they may respond to the pull request and we can take it from there. The next item listed here is EIP bot issues and EIPV issue updates and agreement on the process to merge and close. So uh, now Ethereum CAT headers have been looking into some issues uh, at EIP, EIP bot GitHub repository and EIPV repository. We have Jose on the call who has been looking into these issues and he has been trying to close the issues. So we are, um, looking for a proper process or maybe kind of agreement on how do we proceed in that direction. Earlier it was Alita and she had uh, the access to maybe close and merge pull request, everything else, but now it is limited. Um, I would pass it on to Jose for his concerns and opinion, thoughts, whatever he have observed so far. Thank you. Yes, uh, issue 58, and issue 53, they are pretty much the same. Uh, comments could be written in the in the repos, so you guys can agree on, on it or not. Uh, issue 55 is a, is a complete modification of the copy copy edit capacity of the bot is basically the, the list for this action has been pretty much close up. There is just one pending issue about the PDF uh, uh, file. And having said that this morning, or oh, I don't know, this afternoon depends, uh, Panda Pit just uh, comment that basically, or maybe we just, we just can split this issue into one that includes the all the actions uh, already pretty much agreed, and the other one to open the discussion for the PDF file. Uh, Greg was uh, not liking the idea, but well, I guess that if we just create separate separate action, we will be able to talk about it and to get an agreement. And the last but not least, uh, since the last call, two issues were closed. Issue 60 and issue 61. That's pretty much about it. I do agree that uh, it looks like this enhancements, um, issue number 55 should be split up into multiple smaller issues that are more targeted so we can discuss them separately. Yeah, I think actually one per uh, numbered item in the comment that I posted would probably be the most appropriate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, we can do. Go ahead. I, I can do that if there's no objections. None for me. I would, I would like to see it also makes it a little more um, consumable for new people that are trying to help out. It allows them to just pick something easy and tackle it and feel a sense of accomplishment. <laughs> 
an excellent point. Yeah, so I, I'll do that. I'll split all that up into like 11 or 12 different issues and then we can discuss in the various threads. Does that work for you? Uh, I'm assuming, Jose, but I'm not uh, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Uh, please also take a look in the, between 50 AM and 53, they are pretty much the same. So we can just close one and, and leave one open as a, to take that action. Okay. Uh, 58 and 63, you say are the same? 53. Fight three. 50 oh, and fight three. And, and 53, okay, sorry. That's the one about the adding or uh, populating the co owner's file with the editors just to get yeah, one file. They're very, are, are very much the same. Is the, is the code owners, I see that. And then 53 is editor approvals required for ambiguous PRs. Is that correct? Yes. When, when you see the discussion, Till the end, there was some comments and agreement to basically just do the same. I see. Okay. Yeah, I'm a little okay. bit behind on. No, that's the fine. Editing, that's fine. So. Okay. That, okay. Yeah. Maybe it's a good segue. Anything else on the bot topic? That's cool for me, thank you. So yeah, um, I'm assuming like, uh, uh, who, so yeah, please go ahead. I was gonna use this as a segue to get into, uh, something that's not on the agenda, but before we move into the insights and apprenticeship stuff. Um, I am like two weeks behind on EIP editing. I've got, my inbox has like 200 emails in it that I need to go through. Um, we could really use a full-time editor um, I know Sam has been, I think Sam does once a week, which is definitely helpful. Um, like Matt has been maybe once every couple of weeks. Um, and that's basically it, I think. And so uh, if anyone out there wants to become an EIP editor, uh, it's definitely useful. I'm, I'm finding myself getting burnt out. And so and I, I don't want to put the EIP editing situation back to where it was before I showed up, which was that EIPs would sit open for like a year with no one touching them. And we had a backlog of 500 or a thousand PRs. Um, I want to avoid that. Um, but at the same time, uh, I have a lot of other things that I'm working on and the uh, EIP editing is probably uh, the one that <laughs> I end up putting off the most and more and more lately I've been putting off more and more. And so, uh, so yeah, so call out there to anyone who wants to become an EAP editor. Um, please just start editing, start providing feedback. Make a PR if, if you want <laughs> into uh, the EAP one, I think, right? Uh, not EAP one, there's uh, the bot file. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah. I think uh, Daniel raised his hand too. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh... Micah, thanks for that call out. And it's something that I'm thinking about. I'm still uh, very, very new. And I'm something that I'm curious about is the, like, what is the onboarding process for EIP editors? Because I see there's kind of a note about the responsibilities of editors in EIP one at the bottom. Um, and, you know, I've seen that I've started coming to some of these meetings, um, but I'm thinking about, you know, it, what is the formal uh, onboarding uh, process like? Because I think that clarity will help me figure out what I need to learn um, to get up to speed and also uh, provide clarity on um, what it would actually entail. So uh, it's, it's a very informal process, basically, it, um, show up on EIPs and review them for, make sure they follow the rules in EIP one and follow the template. Uh, you can see if you, if you want to go above and beyond, you could go back and look through comments uh, that I have put, for example, on other people's EIPs to get an idea of the types of things I look for and the types of things that I, I follow. I'm um, saying thing with Sam or like client or any other editors, just kind of, if you, if you wanted to look through, see what other people are doing. Um, but yeah, basically just, 
comment on people's pull requests and say, hey, fix this, 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 and this. Um, these things need to be changed, et cetera. Uh, the, the job itself, the day-to-day the -day of the job is basically just making sure people's proposals are, you know, follow a general standardized format and style. And so EIPs are consistent across each other. Um, the kind of more philosophical side of it is, um, and this is, this is maybe just me. Uh, so take this next part with a grain of salt. But so hang on, before, a, before you continue, Mike, I just want to say, like, I think the actual technical formal process for becoming an EIP editor is making a pull request against that bots file. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, that's true. So, so the, the bare minimum, if you want to be an editor, uh, make a pull request against the bots file. That being said, um, generally, we probably won't approve you unless we've seen you do some editing in advance. So step one is kind of build up a reputation within the EIP editor community, which is very small, as someone who is helpful and actually adds value. And then step two is adding your name to uh, the list. I'll send you a link. Submit a PR, add your name to this that list um, or add your GitHub handle to that list. And then again, assuming you have built up a minor reputation amongst editors as someone who has been helpful and useful, then we'll approve and you'll now be an editor. Um, it's a very simple process. Um, as far as like philosophy, the one thing that I'm a little bit worried about and has probably the number one thing that has kept me from stepping down is that I really want the EIP uh, process to be incredibly neutral. Um, and this is starting to come up in some of the discussions that we're seeing. Um, but one of the ways that I, I worry, and in the past, we have lost this for a period of, period of a couple of years. Uh, I don't want it to be an old boys club where if you happen to know some know the right people, you get your EIPs merged. And if you don't know the right people, you can't get your EIPs merged. And so it was like this for a while where, you know, if you knew somebody, if you knew one of the editors, you could ping them out of band and say, hey, can you merge my EIP? And that set of people was also given a privileged position where they could just write whatever they wanted in the EIP and no one would question them. And so I want to make sure that the EIP process remains as neutral as possible and as open to anyone who wants to contribute as possible. So that means that someone comes in, they submit a PR, they're treated equally, whether they're a core dev that's been around since the beginning of Ethereum or there's someone new into the ecosystem that just wants to help contribute. And so that's the, the harder part of the job uh, because it does entail you know, telling some of the old guard no, you need to follow the same rules as everybody else. Um, and it also does entail a lot of helping people who have no idea what they're doing learn to contribute meaningfully. That was very helpful. Helpful. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, 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 making oh. contributions, comment on things, give people feedback. I have a, I have shared the link of a handbook that um, uh, contains the information that is not available on EIP one, but is a kind of a rough process that is being followed around EIP editing or um, documenting an EIP or even if uh, needed for uh, reviewing the proposal. So you may follow that, and there is a section how we can onboard an apprentice to be. Um, formally added as an EAP editor. There you will find the link that Micah has already shared in the chat here. Great, thanks a lot. I, yeah, I haven't seen this doc before. I'll take a close look at it. Um, and um, yeah, appreciate the uh, advice on, on how to get started and, and kind of uh, build a, uh, a trust in the community and and a, a profile of someone who who might be a good um, editor. I, I see the, the 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 path and and what it entails more clearly now. Thanks a lot. And to be clear, the bar is really low for building that trust. Uh, basically, just show up and be helpful and useful. Um, you know, for a extended period of time, like someone. We want to avoid it. So we've had in the past people show up to help out with editing and they like help out for a week and then they disappear and never be seen again. And so we do want a little bit of a track record, just someone who continues to show up and doesn't get burnt out after a week. 
Um, but beyond that, there's, there's no really no hard requirements. It's just, you know, if you're helpful and useful and you're providing good feedback, um, even if you make mistakes sometimes, that's fine. Um, just like as long as you're showing, you know, capacity to learn and, and whatnot, uh, the bar really is pretty low. Sounds great. Yeah. Um, um, the, the thing that intimidates me is my uh, technical uh, capability, but it sounds like a lot of the work is um, doesn't even require that much uh, technical knowledge. It's just there. there's a lot of um, rules to uh, edit the IP so that they're just understandable to the community. Yeah, the, the technical knowledge isn't, it's, we generally want to have someone on the EAP editors that is active and has deep technical knowledge, um, but not everybody needs to have that. There is signif very significant value someone can add uh, without any technical knowledge, just like, you know, basic grammar checking and formatting and style and, you know, making sure the rules are followed, things like that, like things that you really, you don't even, like, it's helpful to know what Ethereum is, but technically you don't need to follow Rules. And so, uh, so yeah, don't feel um, intimidated if you're not like an Ethereum expert. Um, I think the, the reason we have a lot of Ethereum experts as editors is because these are people who have tried to make changes to Ethereum and gotten frustrated that there weren't any editors, and so they joined. Uh, it's not because editors need to be Ethereum experts. It's just Ethereum experts happen to be the class of people who generally stumbles into the EAP process. Sounds great. Thanks. Yeah, and uh, appreciate the the encouragement. I will uh, give some of this a, a try, hopefully, and be uh, be consistent about it. Thanks to you, Daniel, and thank you, Michael. Um, on the same topic, I have one question for you, maybe uh, for Micah and other EAP editors. Um, I see some of the pull requests are open on EIPV on GitHub. I'm wondering like, um, are we waiting on something or who needs to approve and get it merged? I'm gonna share the link here. Uh, EIPV was most re recently written by Matt. And so Matt would be an ideal person. Um, yeah, I mean, ideally, we'd have more people. Uh, I don't actually know anyone other than that who would be qualified to. Uh, did you mean to link something different? No, no. Actually, my question is, like, now that EAPV is uh, moved from Matt's personal repository to Ethereum repository, so I'm assuming that now all, I mean, like, obviously, you and whoever has this uh, accessibility as an admin for these repository may be able to merge it. Oh, so, so yeah, so I don't know who has admin rights. Um, is it just uh, Ethereum slash EIPV? Right. I can check to see if I do. Um, uh, sorry, I'm checking to see if I have rights to edit stuff. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I appear to be on some sort of team. Um, that being said, I know nothing about Rust. <laughs> so I wouldn't usefully be able to merge anything or review anything. Like I can click a button to, to merge, but we should definitely have someone else be, actually read uh, code and changes, not me. Okay. And for the EIP bot, um, how comfortable you are for merging pull requests over there? Um, same thing. The one difference is the EAP bot I actually speaks. Uh, I know the language that's written in, um, but I don't actually know anything about the bot itself. I, ideally, Alita would approve and merge. Um, I don't know if she's still around though. Um, if we don't have anybody, I can click the button. But again, it'd be good to get someone reviewing who is actually understands it. Uh, in a perfect world for any code base, you want at least two people and who can, who are both familiar with the code base um, to, so that way when one person submits a change, the other person can read it and confirm this is, is valuable. If we don't have that, 
um, I can click the button, <laughs> but I can't commit to doing more than just clicking the button. No, I get it. I, I was just trying to figure out the way uh, how how we can move forward in absence of anyone being like key person who may or may not be around. I know Alita is still around. She sometimes shows up in one of the meetings, so maybe we can take help of her for now. But um, I'm just trying to explore the best way in which we can manage this without uh, you know an so intervention of key people. Sure. For the EIPV changes, um, so PR number 46, um, I can merge, I can review and merge that one. Um, probably I'll, I'll re-review it. And then for number 44, I think we're just basically waiting to get a uh, general agreement, but um, if Alex and I are the only two participating, then I can just merge it. Yeah, I can handle these two. The volume is small enough, um, but don't rely on me for that in the future. <laughs> right. But uh, if, uh, okay, uh, how do people think about having these issues and pull requests even discussed in uh, the EAP IP meeting? Like you said that number 44 is waiting for general agreement. I don't know. It's been um, open since Yeah, we, we, we should talk yeah. about it. Yeah, we when should. When we have more people here. Of course. Then I'll start adding it to the discussion items. All right, that's helpful. Uh, I was curious how to manage these two depositories because they are now piling up with issues <laughs> and we don't want to end up in a bad situation there. All right, anything else on this topic? Okay, if not, then probably we can go ahead with the next item. I see a comment from Jose. Sooner than later, bot would need additional coding to be merged. That's right. Uh, we are trying to figure out a way how to get uh, these codes be merged. All right, moving on to the next item. Uh, it is EAP's Insight monthly report. Nothing much has changed since the last meeting, except we have got one uh, new ERC category Proposal added as draft. The number is EIP 4955 vendor specific metadata extension for non fungible tokens. There is one uh, small non normative change to a final EIP 721. Other than that, there is one EIP which is in the last call, and the last call is ending on 24th April. The EIP is EIP 1967, standard proxy storage slots. So oh, people, if you are listening and if you have any question, comment, concern related to this particular proposal, please reach out to the authors or participate in the discussion at discussion tool link. This proposal will be marked uh, final very soon because its last call is ending in next four days. In this month, um, EIP Insight, I have added the, uh, ad an additional chart to represent the different categories of uh, EIPs since uh, August 2021, because that's when they started collecting data individually. So now we can see uh, how many uh, core ERC networking and interface EIPs are being proposed as new EIP. And uh, when they are merged, I'm considering the data only if it is merged, if it is still in the open pull request form, but the data will not be reflected here. So uh, that's one new thing. And if people want to have different kind of data, if looking for any other stats that can be added, please uh, let us know in either in the agenda item comment or reach out to me. So that's all on EIP status reporting. The next item is EIP Editors Apprenticeship Meeting. This week, the meeting was postponed because of uh, Dev Connect. So we are gonna have this meeting two weeks from now, but a day before on Tuesday. The last item 
for discussion today is uh, looking into action items from the previous meeting. Just trying to pull out the notes here. Okay, have CI update the creation date of an EIP to the date it was first merged into the EIP repo. I remember having this discussion, but I'm not sure if we did anything about it. Does anyone remember like what was needed here? Yeah, which one was this? Uh, 53.1, okay, let me share the meeting notes. So it is about, um, we discussed about uh, the mention of a creation date of an EIP and- uh, oh, uh and yeah. nothing, I don't think anybody's done anything about that. Yeah, right. So, I mean, I'm just blanking on what was the action item, if there was any. Do we need to create an issue in the EIP bot? Uh, yes, the EIP bot would be where this would go. So that would be, I think the next step, yes, would be create an issue in the uh, EIP bot repo to automatically add the creation date okay. uh, when a new draft is merged. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that as part of splitting up issue 55. That would be great. Okay, the next uh, action is uh, update the bot not to touch EIP1. <laughs> How's that gonna work? I uh, don't know. Just again, someone needs to do it. Uh, if there's not an issue in the EIP bot repo, someone should create one. Actually, there, there is, so th this is in the bot repo already, I think. Okay. I, I think, uh, sorry. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, no, I just was just going to add that EIP1, and I, if I don't remember well, was any other living uh, forever EIP? That was the yeah, comment in the exact. Yeah, EIP1 cool. is the only living EIP, so some, something Correct. that updated all living EIPs or EIP1, uh, both would work. I'm okay with Excellent. Yeah, that's clear. Okay. And the last one is update bot to have minimum two EIP authors approval um, before March. It's specifically, that should be added. Uh, you should add the word EIP1 to that. So. Um, right. Got it. Mm. Okay. Update bot to yeah, have minimum one. two EIP authors approval before the March of EIP1 pull request, right? Yeah. Got it. And really, before immersion of ambiguous pull requests, I think we already have a uh, uh, issue out for this. So that one uh, doesn't need to be an action item. It's basically we just need to wait for someone to write the code to do it. Okay. There's no action right now. We're just waiting for someone to write code. Okay. Okay. Maybe uh, we'll look into it and revisit these items next meeting. Hopefully it will be done close by the time, but yeah, we'll revisit. And uh, I think that's all that concludes the meeting for today. Um, anything else anyone would like to bring up for today's discussion? Nope, nothing for me. Uh, well, we made quite good progress. Like uh, now we are at some um, clarity with the executable specs and core EIP process. Now we are looking into some general uh, consensus. Maybe we be able to discuss it further in the next meeting and look into the proper path for uh, moving in the direction of pulling out core EIPs or leaving it in, in the same uh, repository. So maybe we'll have a decision, not decision, general consensus, as I say, uh, in the next meeting. So we made quite a good progress. And uh, yeah, that's all I think I have to share with you guys today. Thank you everyone for joining. See you all in two weeks. Thank you. Hey, later. Th thank you. Bye guys. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.